Hi, everybody. (laughs) I am sitting in front of my microphone. No notes. No nothing. Nothing to read. I'm just going to talk to you guys. Oh, my God. And yes, it's been some time. It absolutely has been some time. Thank you for all of your lovely messages, your emails, your notes, checking in on me, asking how I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. Um, It's really an interesting thing to experience these changes that I'm going through. I um, took a good long look at my podcasts, and I think they're probably going to be changing somehow. They might be turning into something shorter and hopefully a little more regular because, you know, as a receiver of podcasts, I know how lovely it is to be able to depend on that like every Monday morning. But for now, what I'm going to do is just pick up the mic and record something really casual. In other words, I'm not going to spend a lot of time editing this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time putting it together. I'll put some music on the front end, music on the back, and it might not be very long, but at least you will hear my voice. At least I will uh, renew the connection between us because I do treasure that. You know, you guys are really awesome. So one of the first things I want to talk about is I want to talk about a question that I saw on one of the subreddits. It was how, how can, or no, I think it was phrased, what does it take to be a good bottom? You know, what makes a good bottom in the pegging formula? And I'm just going to jump right in. I mean, there's so many other things that I could talk to you about right now, but this is what's at the forefront of my mind. So I'm just going to grab it, run with it, record it, put it up, and there you go. And we're just going to call this podcast number 278, even though it probably isn't going to be very long. So back to the question, what makes a good bottom when you're doing pegging? Well, you know, of course, this is going to factor in a whole bunch in terms of who your top is, who your partner is, because we all have different preferences, absolutely. I think that there are some that are fairly universal. One of the first ones that comes to mind is someone who is responsive. Just like you cock owners out there, don't really enjoy having sex with somebody who's just lays there. I believe they call them the dead fish or something like that, right? Well, there are dead fishes with pegging too, you guys, okay? And it's lovely when there's noises, there's responsiveness, you know, there's some reactions because that gives us feedback. That gives us, um, well, not just feedback, but for me, it makes it really, really exciting to know that I am getting this partner of mine to make these sounds that they don't usually make when we have other kinds of sex. I mean, that is kind of what it comes down to for me. And there is absolutely some really interesting quality of sounds that come out of bottoms during the pegging thing when you get kind of into the deeper levels of pegging, if you will. So I think that's one that will go across the board. I really don't know of any tops who have said, nope, I just want them to lay there, not move, and be totally silent. (laughs) I don't think I've ever had that. So it's not just the sounds, it's the moving around. And maybe it's the kind of fucking back a little, if you will. Of course, that does depend on what uh, position you're in, absolutely. So what else makes a good bottom besides responsiveness? Oh, right there at the top of the list is communication. (laughs) And what do I mean by communication? I mean the ability to ask for what you want, the ability to voice it when you want a little bit of adjustment. In other words, you know, if you move a little bit to the left, I think it'll feel better. Something like this. Communication is huge because what that allows you to do is finesse that coming together. And ideally, you have a top who is open to receiving these little asks and desires and hints and whatever you want to call them. Because I think that's the way that it works really, really well. It's not the way that it works the best because, you know, I always hold space for people and there's so many different ways to do this. You know, I think back to the story that I tell every time I teach one of my beginner's classes 
I wrote an article called Pegging and Intimacy. And part of the reason that I wrote it was because there's a zillion, zillion hopeful bottoms out there who are putting up ads like, hey, I got this ass to fuck in Fort Lauderdale. Come and get it, right? And the point I was trying to make was the whole intimacy thing. Not that there has to be intimacy between a top and a bottom, but there has to be at least some sort of a connection. And, you know, this is not black and white. Nothing uh, nothing about any of this is ever black and white. But my point is, is that it's really rare for it to be a Tinder hookup pegging situation, partly because there's a lot of trust that's involved with that role reversal, but also because there's a lot of effort on the part of the top, okay, on the part of your giver. So typically this is not something you can just grab somebody and say, hey, do this to me, because there's a lot involved and it takes a lot of skill and effort and all kinds of different things. So I wrote this article and I put it up on FetLife and I uh, got a whole bunch of people that, you know, went, got in there and said, yeah, yeah, it's, that's the best way. It's the best way is when it's intimate. And the little red flags went up in the back of my head as a sex educator because, you know, nothing's ever black and white and nothing applies to everyone. And sure enough, this guy got on there and he said, well, no, not really, not for me. That might be the way it is for you, but it's not that way for me because I like being treated just like a thing. That's my kink. So if there's any intimacy between me and the person who fucks me, then it kind of ruins it for me. So I don't know. Given that scenario that I just described, would he just lay there and not say anything and not move? Maybe that would be expected of him if he was being treated like a thing. So see what I mean? <laughs> there is really space for so many different ways to do this. But in general, yes, responsiveness, moving around, communication, asking for what you want. And again, in that situation I just described, you know, the person at the bottom would not be expected at all to voice their desires. And of course, so all of this probably should be negotiated beforehand about what is permissible and what is not, what is a hard limit and all of those things so that the scene, so to speak, can be experienced to the satisfaction of both of you so that neither of you are crossing over boundaries of any sort. So, okay, communication, responsiveness, what else? Um, the ability to relax, I think, is really something that I enjoy. And that ties in with responsiveness. Because the more relaxed you, you are, the more you're going to enjoy it. And that includes your whole body as well as your ass. <laughs> you know, if you're able to open up and take it, so to speak, that can be really, really exciting. Absolutely. And being eager to take it as well. So so let's see, what's the list so far? We've got responsiveness, communication, the ability to relax, the eagerness to get fucked. Okay, what else makes it a good bottom? I think at this point it branches off into individual preferences. Like for some of us who enjoy being dominant tops, then we would prefer or we would enjoy expressions of submission from our bottoms. Um, but if it's the other way around, then we would probably prefer direction. In other words, if, you, if you're not a dominant top and you are a submissive giver of the pegging formula, that, as I understand it, and actually, I've gotten a fair amount of feedback on this that I've, I've watched go by. People talking about, as a giver, if you're foundationally submissive, it can be really difficult. It can put you through some changes. It can be a not easy situation. So if that's the situation, and when I sit back and I try and put myself in that, in that mind space of what would that be like, it's really hard for me because I feel like I'm foundationally dominant. But then I thought, well, okay, what if somebody asked me, just, you know, do this kink with me and just be submissive just for one night? <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> so I think that is at least an approximation of how difficult it must feel for a foundationally submissive giver of pegging to actually do the pegging. So in that case, I'm imagining it might be easier for the giver to get instructions, to get hints, to be told what to do, as opposed to, 
needing to run the whole show themselves. It might make that a little bit easier. What else makes a good bottom? Well, in my world, panties, garter, stockings, <laughs> but the kind of panties that are totally accessible. So in other words, there's no panty strap there that gets in the way when you get down to the fucking. And of course, <laughs> the trick to that, you guys, the trick to that, if you're into wearing the lovely silky things, is you put the garter belt and the stockings on. Then you put the panties on over the top. Uh -huh. That way the panties come off, the garter belt is still on with the stockings and you have this lovely manly bits. They're all framed beautifully with lace and satin and things. So in my world, <laughs> that makes for a lovely bottom, visually at least. What else makes for a good bottom? So clearly I have a, a certain perspective. What I'm interested in is hearing from other givers who have different perspectives. What do you think makes a good bottom? Let's put all the suggestions we can out there for the receivers and let them know sort of the range of what we enjoy. And, you know, when I said eagerness, eagerness to get fucked, that it can also be defined as enthusiasm. Oh, where my mind went for a moment is, you know, periodically there'll be threads that come through the subreddit uh, sex that, you know, what makes a good blowjob? And by far, more often than anything else, it's enthusiasm. <laughs> you know, your technique doesn't even have to be that good as long as you're not hurting the person. If your enthusiasm is there, if you are eager to do this, so yes, that enthusiasm and, and eagerness, I think, are the same thing. But that word came to mind when I was talking about this. But then again, okay, I'm doing devil's advocate with my mind. It's all spinning. Imagine a situation where you have the giver who likes to do role play and likes to role play consensual non-consent. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's like you're pretending that you are taking advantage of this person. You're holding them down, tying them up, doing whatever, fucking them, and they don't want to be, even though they really do want to be, but they are totally down with this role play and they want to pretend like you are holding them down and fucking them and ruthlessly, if you will. So yes, in that case, you might want somebody to be begging you to stop because that might be really hot for you. <laughs> See what I mean? Oh my gosh, there's so many different things that you can do. Yes. Okay, what else makes a good bottom? Well, again, in my world, because I'm dominant, I really like to be served. So one of the things in my world that makes a good bottom is everything is laid out and prepared for me. And then afterwards, everything is cleaned up and put away nicely. You know, not to, to interrupt the cuddling afterwards, because the cuddling afterwards is really important. But at some point in time, before they leave, whether they spend the night or what have you, everything is attended to, cleaned, put away nicely, arranged, if you will. Yes, I really, really enjoy that. But then again, I like being served and I'm dominant, so there you go. <laughs> uh, what else? Oh, <laughs> of course, how could I forget this? Cleaning out adequately, making sure that you are as clean as you can be. I know sometimes that's difficult for you receivers. And I know that it is an area of concern because of course, if you really want this whole pegging thing, you wanna be as clean as you can, of course you do. And I don't think there's very many receivers out there that basically don't give a shit, ha ha, you know, pun intended, <laughs> because that's not cool if you do that, you know, sort of like, hey, it's not that big of a deal, it's just a little shit, too bad, I don't want to take the time to clean out. In my world, someone like that does not deserve to be a receiver of pegging, even though I do get that it is a process and it is a, it's something that takes time, it's something you have to attend to. But you know, there's lots of things that we have to attend to. And I don't know, I think in the spirit of presenting yourself to your partner the way that they would like you to be presented, unless you're going over your own boundaries, like hair-wise, you know, what gets shaved and what doesn't, if you're willing to cater to your partner's preferences. But this is a pretty important preference is, okay, when I fuck you, I want you to be as clean as possible. And not as clean as possible in terms of, oh, I have to do 15 enemas before I get fucked every single time. 
Because as I teach in the beginner's class, you're really only playing in that rectal canal. So most of the time rinsing out the rectal canal, unless you really go for it with a fairly long toy, you're going to be fine. But yeah, staying clean or being clean, presenting as clean. Yeah, that's wonderful. And having the things arranged that you might need. When I teach the beginner's class, I also talk about having uh, hand towels and things there, covering your play space, having the stuff that you need. And also those hand towels come in really wonderfully handy. <laughs> At the end of the pegging, you can just grab one of those hand towels, wrap it around the toy, slip out of the harness, put it off the side of the bed, and do your cozy times if your receiver is interested in some aftercare. Um, and speaking of aftercare, anal penetration is a very vulnerable thing. And sometimes receivers are a little unprepared for how intense it is. And whether or not you get that emotional thing or not, sometimes it's just a little bit overwhelming in terms of the intensity of it. And it can put you through some changes as a receiver. So I talk about aftercare and about how wouldn't it be lovely if the givers asked if you'd like to be cuddled or held or something like that. But the ability to let go enough to open that part of yourself up to that vulnerability is something I just absolutely treasure. And I totally got that for some of you receivers. This is not a comfortable place to be. But once you are with a partner that you trust, going into that territory, I have found rarely is a negative thing. It's almost always a really positive thing, whether it's an experience that you treasure, an experience that you learn from, a bonding thing for you and your partner. It can be all of those things. And my mind is kind of hopping all over the place now. So I'm going to go back to communication because one of the parts of communication is to not do the I can take it manly man thing. Like, you know, oh, this isn't quite comfortable and it feels a little weird and maybe it hurts a tiny bit and it would feel better if she did X, Y, and Z, but I'm not going to say anything because I'm a dude and I can take it. <laughs> this is what I don't want. And so this is what I mean when I say communication, the ability to, and the willingness, oh, that's important, to speak up to ask, to suggest, to express yourself, and to let your partner know when it's less than optimal and, and you have maybe an idea of what would make it better. But most important is not to do that I can take it thing. And I'm also going to go back to responsive and the verbal aspect of that, the making sounds. I'm a little different in terms of like the dirty talk thing. I like sounds. I like a, uh, someone who is responsive in terms of moaning and things like that, and maybe a few words here and there, but I don't like the running commentary. That drives me nuts. <laughs> but you know, some of you might really enjoy that. Some of you givers like the dirty talk when they're just going, you know, the strings of sentences never stop because they're so excited that you're fucking them, right? For me, it's a whole lot better when it is sounds and moans and gasps and things like that and occasional yes and oh God and, you know, the religious stuff. Yeah, that's good. That's always good. <laughs> what else makes a good bottom? <laughs> and okay, here's something else. Experience. Now, I know this is something that's difficult to get if you don't have it. However, what I mean by experience is that you know your own body, that you've done enough solo play and or you have enough experience getting pegged where you know what you like and you know what works better than something else. Because if you don't, then we're both kind of going in blind. <laughs> and it's not that that's a horrible thing. Sometimes that's exactly where couples start. But if you know what you like and you know the way to turn the toy or the way to stroke or the, you know, where, how you have to turn your body or arch your back or something like that to make it be the magic thing, right? That can be really, really wonderful because if you know the path to get you to this exquisite place, yeah, that can be great to be able to lead your partner there and tell them how to do this to you. Okay, here's another one. Um, and this is only for my world. This is my preferences. You know, take all these with a grain of salt. Some of them are going to resonate with you and some of them won't. This is why I'm really interested in hearing from the givers about what they would like 
with their own particular bottom or whatever bottom? What makes a good bottom? I want the answer to that question. But another thing that I really enjoy is the willingness to try and take a slightly bigger toy. And I know this is like dicey territory because clearly you want to respect the ass. You don't want to push too hard, but it's that dominant thing that I have. And there is an aspect of the, mm, the fantasy of giving my partner just a little bit more than they can handle that is just such a freaking turn on for me. But that is one of those fantasies that typically should stay a fantasy because you don't ever really want to give them more than they can handle because then they're not having a good time. They might got injured and things like that. So it has to be that fine line, but the willingness to go a little bit bigger for me, ooh, that is a major turn on. That is a fun thing for me. That is such a turn on. At the same time, it does have to stay within that territory of still being safe and doable. But there's that moment. I mean, it can be even be a role play where it's like, okay, I want to fuck you with that big one. You know, to have that little look of, of shock or fear or what have you and then go okay, I'll try, or something like this, you know, even if you know you can take it, I mean, that's really fun for me, absolutely, but then that might be something that is absolutely not fun for somebody else, there you have it. Here's another thing that makes a good bottom, if you know that you're planning pegging sexy times, like that night, that afternoon when the kids are at grandma's or whatever, it's lovely for the receiver to recognize that, yes, this takes a fair amount of effort for the giver and to, to kind of, mm, I don't know, take over a few things that they normally do, do a few errands, you know, for them or tasks or jobs that they usually do, give them a little bit of a break so that they are well rested and feel like, yes, I've got lots to give. And when I say this immediately, I think about turning that around to the typical roles in sex and I really really hope that when there's a cock fucking a vagina that you vagina owners now recognize you know if you've done the pegging giving thing right you know that fucking someone is an athletic event it takes a fair amount of energy so if you're planning regular sexy times like PIV like penis and vagina right that you would do the same thing for your partner and know that this is something that takes a lot of effort and so you know, give them some space, help them out, make sure to try and do whatever you can so that they arrive at that place in bed with you, not totally exhausted from everything they've done that day, because you know how that feels. So yeah, <laughs> that's what makes a good bottom. How interesting that you can flip that around. See the lessons you learn. It's amazing. Okay, so I think that's going to be the podcast. <laughs> This is a new format, clearly. <laughs> what else do I have to say to you lovely people? I have to say that I'm way behind on thanking all of you for donations, new patrons, and all of those really generous things that you've done, uh, partly because I haven't done a podcast in a while, and partly because that just sort of slipped by the wayside because I got to the point where I was really needing an assistant. So, Know that I'm grateful. If you never hear your name read on my podcast, please do know that I'm grateful. There are also a bunch of you who have written me and said, hey, play the music for me because, you know, we did the deal. And I will get to that, but that is not this podcast. So what else do I have to tell you? Oh, I am including in the show notes an amazing link. If you take the time to read this, it'll kind of blow your mind. And I know that I mentioned this before, but honestly, I have not actually taken the time to read this myself. And when I say I mentioned it before, I mentioned it in every class that I teach with the webinars for beginners. And what it is, is it's over at Aneros.com and it's in their wiki, okay? So they have a wiki of all kinds of information and they have created their own terminology for certain things, like they call it a super O, like a super orgasm. And basically what that means is that experience of having an orgasm that is achieved by a concurrent 
prostate stimulation and penile stimulation, and that you know thing that most of you talk about being about 10 times as powerful as a normal orgasm, that is just cock-centric. Yeah, they call that a super O. So what they've done is talked all about prostate orgasms, and I think it's really quite a very interesting and informative read for those of you who are kind of on that path and really craving that. Because the first thing to know is that a prostate orgasm is really not like a cock-centric orgasm. It's not like the spasming, ejaculating thing. You, there is a, there, It can be like that in terms of it having an ejaculation, but sometimes there's dry, sometimes there's wet. And then there's this type of orgasm that is just simply like waves of euphoria. And those can be done over and over and over again. <laughs> there's some of you who had said, yeah, I, I kind of tapped out after number 29, or, you know. But even better, some of you at the end of doing a session like that are able to actually get an erection and have PIV. So lots to learn in that regard. I'm going to put that link in the show notes because I think it is so worth checking out. Absolutely. So there are, are three things here. One would be that link. Go and read it. Check it out. One would be I want to hear from the givers about what in your world, in your pegging world, makes a good receiver. And last but not least, I would absolutely like to hear from those givers who feel as if they are foundationally submissive. And what I mean by that is like, not a switch, mm -mm, totally submissive in my, se in my sexy time stuff, right? I would like to hear from you about how you handle pegging with your partner and perhaps something about your journey if you have kind of gone back and forth on that if you found it difficult all of that kind of stuff and by the way I do have a discord channel chat okay for givers only it is only for givers so I'd be happy to give you the link and the invite to that but I will uh, ask for something to vet you. In other words, I need to see your FetLife profile, your Reddit profile, something like that, so I can indeed figure out that you are a giver because we've had a lot of guys try and join. And there is something about that Discord chat that is really precious. I'm learning some stuff. It's really quite valuable. There is also a co-ed chat and a men-only chat uh, I ducked my head into the co-ed chat and really didn't care for it and didn't want to moderate it. So even though I'm a member there, I really don't show up very much. But you givers, absolutely, you know, the, the uh, pegging giving chat is happening thing. And I will gladly send you an invite. And, it, you know, this sounds not equal. It sounds like this is not cool, not fair, right? <laughs> But I really am trying to encourage more givers, absolutely. And I understand that with pegging, there are challenges to being a receiver as well. I feel like it would be lovely to have someone who was willing to moderate a receiver's chat, receivers only, right? And do that and have, you know, discuss the difficulties that receivers go through as well. Because I learned from listening to you guys but I suspect that having a, a receivers only chat, the same thing's gonna happen as the one what happens with the givers only. Different conversations take place when you have sectioned out that group of people. And sometimes those conversations go a little bit deeper and into territory that sometimes isn't talked about when it's more all inclusive. And as much as I don't like, you know, non-inclusivity. This can be valuable sometimes. So if anybody wants to step up to the plate and say, hey, I've been pegging freaking forever, and I'd be happy to moderate that. Um, I don't really know if anybody's moderating that men only chat, but the invite for it is at the sticky on the subreddit straight pegging. There is no space in between. It's called straight pegging. And at the top is a sticky, and there are invites to the, both of those discords, the, the co-ed and the men's. And I know I've talked about this before, but it's been a long time. <laughs> and there are some of you who haven't heard a podcast from me in a really long time, and maybe you missed that one, and there you go. So, okay, I think I might call this podcast What Makes a Good Bottom, and we'll just leave it there. So, thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Oh, there is one more thing I wanted to tell you guys. So 
you know, the phone number you've been hearing forever, and then me telling you guys, well, this is a drag because Microsoft took it over and blah, 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 and Skype and all of that stuff. I solved that problem while I have been away and you have been missing me and Jones in for the podcasts. Here's what I did. I bought a prepaid AT&T phone. I ported the number from Skype over to the AT&T phone. Then I ported the number from the AT&T phone <laughs> to <laughs> Google Voice. So now I have a Google Voice number and it's got all the bells and the whistles. It's got an outgoing message with my voice. You can text me. You can call and leave a message and you'll hear my voice so you'll know that you have the right number, right? And whatever message you leave will not get erased. So I'm so happy I've done that. And I really apologize to those of you who called that number, 805-500-6544, and left messages and lovely things. And they just went by the wayside because Skype was so difficult to deal with after Microsoft took it over. Yeah, I have bailed off of there. The funny part of that story is that that prepaid phone that I got from AT&T, I think I paid like 30 bucks for it, right? And so I was going to go take it back to the AT&T store, right? And then I read the uh, fine print, right? And it said there's a $55 restocking fee. <laughs> so that meant I would actually have to pay them to take it back, right? Instead, I put it up on a Facebook uh, local Facebook thing, somebody who needs a phone. It's just your basic phone. No big deal. It's really cheap, right? And I gave it away. So there you have it. But I am really excited that now that number 805-500-6544 is usable, is easy to use. You know that you've got the right number. You can leave a message. It won't disappear. You can text even. Woohoo. Okay. I'm excited about that. Okay, you guys, I'm out of here. I'm going to try and get this posted up before I do my webinar at 6 p.m. It is 4.55 now. I might just make it. <laughs> this is so exciting. A podcast is going up. Yay. <laughs> Take care, everybody. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>